My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of Rebuild North Bay Foundation. This podcast is specifically designed to bring you people who have been through what maybe you have just gone through or that you are concerned about. We created the podcast, Hide a Disaster, to show you the breadth and depth of humanity in the midst of this really terrible thing that happened. I wanted to do this podcast so that I could bring some of the most amazing leaders that I've ever known in my life to you. You may have just experienced a disaster and you may be looking around and you are dealing with trauma and the shock of it. And you may be wondering, I don't know how to do this part. And so we purposefully made this podcast into different sections and different topics of recovery so that you could pick and choose what would work for you at that time. So welcome to How to Disaster, and thank you for giving us your time. Welcome again to How to Disaster, a playbook to recover and rebuild and reimagine. Now today we have something a little bit different. Like how do you prepare for a disaster? Most of the people that we talk to have been through a disaster. And what we talk about is how did they respond to and recover from and rebuild? But there is a really important role for each of us in how we actually prepare for a disaster so we can take care of our families. I'm really pleased today to introduce you to my good, good friend, Josh. Carol. Now, Josh became a bit of a citizen prepper after he experienced the 2017 wildfires in our area. Josh happens to be one of my husband's very best friends, and so I spent some time with him during the 2017 fires when he was at his, he came home from Los Angeles and he actually helped um, ensure that his neighborhood and his mother's house was safe. I really enjoy talking to Josh about these things. And I think that there's actually a lot to learn and there's some humor in there and there are some really practical tips and things that each of us can do. So we've done something a little bit different this time. We are bringing the podcast to you with Josh in two parts. Um, part one is what I'm introducing to you right now. And I think you really enjoy um, hearing about his experience, but also what led him to become what I like to call a citizen prepper. Uh, he is just doing really what should be in many ways the bare minimum for many of us who are now in a sense like climate refugees. As I sit here today, Texas is in um, a deep freeze and many people who never expected to have snow in their area are not only without power, but they are also suffering the effects of climate change. Josh's um, Preparations could work for really any type of disaster. His is really specific to earthquake and wildfires. But if you are in an area that's suffering superstorms or these kind of uh, wind, rain, freezing events, there's also a lot to learn here. So I hope you enjoy this time with Josh. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is a very good friend of mine, Josh Farrell. Josh was by my side for many days during the fires of 2017. Um, he grew up here in Sonoma and he was um, profoundly affected by that experience. And I'm having him on today as part of our um, how to prepare for a disaster as a citizen. Like what are some of the basic things you can do? This seems like something that every person needs to think about. FEMA wants you to know that you are on your own for 72 hours minimum. Um, it's better to be prepared for even longer than that, but it's really important that we take certain steps as just uh, citizens in the world for how we can care for ourselves. So I'm so happy that you would um, spend this time with us, Josh, and just talk to us about first your experience and what led you to this moment. And then we're gonna go through some of um, the things that you have procured and some of your um, current ideas um, for how we can be even better prepared, so. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, Jen, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Um, and you know, I feel pretty passionate about this given our situation a couple, few years ago, almost coming up on three years uh, with a fire in Sonoma. But um, that was kind of my impetus. Honestly, uh, I was not prepared before that fire, uh, really at all. I think I, I, I was prepared and then I had like, uh, an old backpack for each for Kirsten, my wife and I, 
uh, each had a backpack underneath the uh, bed that had shoes, a uh, pair of pants, underwear, socks, and a shirt. And that was our, kind of our earthquake thing. Like you got to get out of the house immediately because of a gas leak or whatever. And we've always had that. But when I went up to Sonoma, there's a whole different ball game. And I was like, oh, I'm playing like, you know, little league and you have to be really prepared. Um, because the Sonoma, you know, I, I rolled into Sonoma probably a little over 24 hours after that fire hit and the gas stations were out, the banks were out of money, like the ATMs meaning. Um, it was a little, you always hear that, but you don't think about it. And then it's like, oh, okay. Um, so just that rolling into town and people panicking. Um, so maybe you can tell people who are not as familiar with um, what happened here, um, the situation with your family, that your mom, you have an elderly mom who recently just passed away. Um, yes. You're concerned, like, why would you jump in your car to come here and, and be of service or to try to help your mom and, her, and the house and your family through this? Like, what happened? Right. So um, I had called both my mom, you know, when it started in Napa, the Atlas Peak kind of kicked off at Atlas Peak um, area. Um, there was a little concern, but Atlas Peak was kind of far away uh, compared, you know, in relative terms at that point. Um, and within 24 hours, it looked like the fire was definitely moving west towards Sonoma over the Mayacamas Mountains. And that's where I got freaked out. My mom, who did just pass away, lived a great 84 years. Uh, at that point, she was 81 and did have a lot of lung issues and um, CPOD, uh, I'm saying that correct, uh, had oxygen tanks in the house already for her breathing. Um, so the big concern was smoke and mobility. And I contacted my Sonoma friends and they were all getting, leaving town all really quickly. Of course, I told my mom, uh, previously when there's fires to have like a to-go bag and all of those kind of things to go as well as my brother and uh, they did not have those to go um, hence me driving 90 miles an hour up the five from Los Angeles it's interesting when I got to Vallejo I probably passed again why you should always have a half a tank is a full is uh, an empty tank because there was a 10 miles of cars coming out of Sonoma and I got from Vallejo to Sonoma I think in 20 minutes, maybe 19 minutes, which is pretty fast because everyone was going one direction and no one was going into Sonoma. But I went in to get my mom out. And at that point, uh, my sister had evacuated my mother. Um, I got there, my brother and I started to get all the kind of expensive stuff in the house, meaning just family pictures, albums, uh, heirloom china or, you know, silver or whatever. It wasn't that much stuff. Um, Packed, back, packed cars um, and headed over to Vallejo, which is where my sister lives. So we evacuated my mom to Vallejo and tried to get as much stuff over there. And then my brother and I came back and my sister came over from Petaluma and we hunkered down and um, we didn't know it was gonna be five days as you didn't. <laughs> uh, it turned into a really long five days with no power at certain points. Um, we had a lot of batteries because my mother's like a depression baby. So that ended up working out great. And there was a freezer with all this old food in it. Cause again, my mother who's 81 doesn't eat a lot, had this whole freezer. So we were pretty prepared in that regards. Um, so we were able to like hunker down, water the house. We had uh, just two hoses uh, and that didn't really come into play till a day or two later when the fire embers started falling on Sonoma. So just to orient people again who are watching this from a different disaster area, um, what happened here is that we had um, the biggest at that time wildfire, the biggest, fastest, scariest wildfire Cal Fire had ever seen. And now it's become much more of the norm. And as we're recording this, you're seeing that play out in um, parts of Oroville, parts of California, Oregon, and Washington. This fire behavior is completely different and it's so much faster and it creates its own weather and it throws embers miles ahead. And an ember is not what you think about like a little ember. An ember can be as large as a car. Like it, and it just throws it way ahead and it's sort of, it's very efficient in that way. Where you grew up and where your mom, um, where, where your family house is, is actually right in downtown Sonoma. 
And that was an interesting experience because I think that um, what people don't always know is that we had 11 fires burning at once. And in Sonoma Valley, because of where we sit, we were surrounded by fire because there was fire. We were on the Napa County border. Yeah. So it was just a very different situation. And, and there was this moment on um, Wednesday or Thursday of that week, the fires actually burned for 23 days, but the scariest 10 days, um, which, and you were in there in the middle of this, you were there in the worst five of those 10 days where Sonoma Valley was really heavily, heavily impacted. Right. Um, the people don't, may not understand it. It was, it was not that you didn't have power and, um, there, and you're down in the flatlands. It's not like you're, so tell the, tell the audience, where does your family live? And so, and why would you normally not think of that as being what we call the wooey, the wildland urban interface? For sure, but, uh, for sure. I, I was under the impression, you know, I'm like, well, look, it's got, we're like a block off the square. My parents moved there in 1964, but how many houses does this, in retrospect, right? <laughs> but I'm like, fire's got to burn through like, you know, hundreds of houses to get to our house, right? That's what my thinking was at the time. And I'm also thinking like a lot of these uh, houses have built, uh, especially uh, in the, some new divisions in the, uh, in the outskirts, they're all to code. So in my brain, I'm like, they're built to code. The fires, they're gonna stop the fire. We don't need to worry about it. Um, I, so I really was there like, oh, the town's kind of evacuating. I'm going to watch over the house. If there's a fire issue, you know, I'm here. But like you said, that happened so fast with the winds. I think they were called devil, devil something winds, but it was nuts. Um, I mean, within two days, we were looking, that fire was 1.2 miles away from downtown Sonoma. I mean, the power was out, the Sonoma cops and sheriffs all went, and I think that's obviously part of their plan. That was pretty amazing to watch how well executed their plan was because it felt like within 24 hours, the Sonoma sheriffs and the police who are awesome moved north uh, to uh, Kenwood in the areas, uh, Agua Caliente, where it was, the fire was pressing because it was coming over that area heading towards Santa Rosa. Um, and then we had Alameda and Oakland cops in, in less than 24 hours. It was like, it was so weird. But it was, I bought them coffee at 7-Eleven a couple of days in a row. Um, I was super impressed with the plan that came. The, no, we didn't know what the plan was. Uh, you're sitting there. We've never had a fire before. It was very well executed and probably why Sonoma didn't burn, honestly. Oh, it's completely why Sonoma didn't burn. And it was also one of the things that I really love about that story is even though they'd never seen that fire behavior before, um, so many of the people who fought that fire. So first of all, just the police side, we had a ton of mutual aid, which is amazing. And, and that's how, when we had to evacuate areas where there are a lot of people who don't speak English, we were fortunate enough from Alameda in particular to have a big contingency of bilingual Spanish speaking people who could, um, deputies who were then dispatched to go out to the Springs in right. order to um, evacuate it. But one of the things I love most about our, our fire story is um, so many of the firefighters grew up here, and even from Cal Fire, and even if they didn't, they came home to fight this fire, and because um, there's hills up um, above in Sonoma, that's where the fire was coming, was encroaching. They knew how, they knew all the party roads in the very back. They knew where to take the dozers, like, because they had such an intimate knowledge of Sonoma, and they were passionate about it. Yeah. Uh, for sure. You know, Sean Norman grew up on Lovell Valley Road and he's coming back from, I think he's up in Placerville, but he's with Cal Fire and he's back and Mike Brown's over, you know, out of, uh, I, I think he's in American Canyon or Vallejo and he's in Sonoma fighting these fires. Um, and you're right, they, they know the area and they can, you know, all of our guys in Sonoma, uh, a lot of them are locals, so they know, you know, the quick routes and you know they can read the terrain really well which is they can and uh, there was a, one and there was actually a, they, they even knew the fire history and so that is one of the reasons why the springs wasn't more impacted is because a retired cal fire guy actually stole a dozer and he spent two days um, doing a fire break up above the white barn i remember uh, i remember hearing that 
I love that story so much. Yeah. So that sort of orients people like the degree to which um, when you think you have time, you don't necessarily have time. And so it's incredibly important that we all be prepared and we take some personal responsibility because the police and fire are actually busy doing other things. And the last thing we want to do is actually get in their way. We want to assist them by knowing how to take care of ourselves. When people ask me the number one thing that they can do, I always say videotape your house on your phone every year. And that way you always have an accurate up to date 10 to 15 minute. I think ours is actually 13 minutes for our house. And if you do by chance lose your home, it will to make all the difference in the world when you go to do your contents replacement. You'll be able to have a picture of it. It's very different from a wind or rain event. In that case, usually you're able to enter back into your home if it hasn't been taken out by a tornado and you can at least take pictures of the damage. But in fire, your three-story home can be reduced to five inches of oily ash in under five, 10 minutes. It just, it just it's, it's very quick. So you may not have time to load up all of your valuables to take them 20 minutes away to Vallejo. In that case, I wanted you to talk about, so you have, you've experienced this disaster, which there's nothing like it until you have actually experienced it. Yeah. And you are now, you, you currently live in Los Angeles, and mm -hmm. we're waiting for you not to be there anymore and for you guys to move home, but I don't know if you're going to do that. Um, you have to talk to my wife about that. <laughs> I totally, I get it, I do, it's just a thing. Um, so, you're, so say that you're driving home, and take us through your thought process, and then take us to um, the, your journey to where you are now, because we want to see some of your stuff. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one thing I just got to say uh, on that note, my friend who lost his house the first night, one of my best friends who I go to spring training with every year, go Giants. Um, he lost everything the first night uh, over on D in Dunbar um, where they got like completely wiped out. But uh, he had not filmed everything in his house. And over the course of a year and a half, and I'm not kidding, it took a year and a half, of him trying to figure out what model his TV was or what mod, because the questions on the insurance are extremely specific. It's not just like, I got a Vizio TV from Costco, so pony up the money. It's what was the model number? When did you purchase it? How old was it? Like it's an insurance company and you're obviously not gonna do all that work, you know, uh, just in case, but you really should videotape everything. If you can videotape or take pictures of the back of some products, if you have time and who doesn't, if you're listen, watching a ball game or I don't know, hanging around the house, just do it really once is enough. But I agree with you go through and do your general one once a year. Um, for sure. Update that. Oh, um, you told me another really helpful thing because we got, we had our go bags ready um, a couple of weeks ago because the fires were just very bad here in Sonoma County. Um, and that was uh, checks, voided checks. Yes. So uh, that's, um, so I have, um, th this is probably the biggest thing that I thought of when I was coming back from the fire. And I did this immediately, even before I got a to-go bag. I thought about this on the way back because we didn't really have, the documents that we had from my mom were like, okay, get, get we're, we're going through all this paperwork, trying to pull stuff out of old files, like house insurance and, 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 and things that are important that I didn't know at the time what was important and what was not. So when I came back, I did a bunch of research and I started to make electronic files to put on a USB drive. It's really simple. Again, you can have the ball game on. Obviously, I, I said ball games three times. So obviously, I'm a Giants fan. I watch a lot of baseball. So uh, baseball lends itself to um, having, you can multitask a lot. Um, so you just start to copy some of this stuff onto a USB drive. Um, that stuff, the FEMA check, super important. I didn't know about this. It is, if your house burns down and you don't have all your bank information, maybe you don't remember your routing number, maybe you don't know your account number. The FEMA checks just avoided check, but you're gonna present that to FEMA. They're usually on the spot pretty quickly, but if you don't have that information, that's gonna create a lot of lag time before you can get the financial support that they offer. So that's one of the many things I have on my USB drive. Do you want me to mention kind of what I have on the USB drive? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, go through it. Yeah, it's just, um, and it's not, I didn't, it's not overkill on it. Um, I basically have um, our healthcare information. So copies of mine and my wife's uh, Kaiser cards. Um, I have uh, 
we actually, when I get to the bags, that'll be more important, but I have backup prescription glasses in our bags. Um, but I do have our prescription information on our, um, on our USB drive. But my wife's like, are you think you're going to go get new glasses in the middle of a disaster? Why would you have to have the prescription? She's a good point. Um, so I have those. I have copies of our licenses on the USB drive, our passports, um, just stuff that you may need. Um, our cat information. If you have a pet, pet thing's pretty big. And I didn't really realize any of this till after that disaster. My, my mom doesn't have any pets, so we didn't need to worry about that. But um, having kind of the vaccination, uh, proof of vaccination uh, in California, they have some pretty strict rules. Your cat can't really go into a shelter in some situations if you don't have the proper documentation. So just take that documentation that you get from your vet when you go there and make a copy and have it ready for you. Um, backup phone numbers, big time. I can't remember anyone's phone number. Um, so uh, I have those all backed up on a, um, on a PDF, my mom's number, my friend's number, all emergency numbers separate on a, on a USB drive. Navigating the recovery process after a fire is challenging, particularly with the additional issues caused by COVID-19. Fannie Mae is here to help. If you live in a FEMA declared disaster area, you can request free assistance from our disaster response network. Fannie Mae, in partnership with Mori Management International's Project Porchlight, launched the Disaster Response Network in 2018. This program uses HUD-approved counselors to offer support. These counselors have been specially trained as disaster coaches. They address the challenges homeowners and renters face when recovering from a disaster. There's no charge for their services. The goal of the Disaster Response Network is to help people return to pre-disaster normal as quickly as possible. Clients are matched with a coach who work with them one-on-one -on -one throughout their recovery. In the initial conversation with clients, coaches review the status of the homeowner's recovery process, including current challenges, decisions that need to be made, and immediate long-term goals. They discuss topics like income and expenses, insurance, housing, credit or debt challenges, as well as aid or other assistance programs that may be available. This may include FEMA applications and Small Business Administration, or SBA, loans. The coach helps the client plan and prioritize the next steps for their recovery. Moving forward, the coach continues to be there for the client, reaching out to them regularly, at least monthly, but more often when needed, for up to 18 months' time. These regular check-ins provide the client the opportunity to ask questions, get help tackling challenges, and keep things moving as they work through their recovery. It's also where coaches can help identify new recovery assistance or grants that have become available, strategize new next steps for recovery, and talk through difficult decisions or priorities. One of the key ways coaches assist disaster response network clients is by helping intervene when something has gone awry. Coaches will, with the clients on the line, call insurance companies to adjust their claims when costs exceed initial estimates, or call the client's creditors to request payment relief. The Disaster Response Network's approach ensures survivors have a personal financial expert working with them throughout their recovery. By helping minimize the financial impact of a disaster, survivors can recover more quickly. To get confidential disaster relief assistance, call the Disaster Response Network at 877-833-1746. Once again, that is 877-833-1746. Or visit knowyouroptions.com slash relief for more information. Um, so one of my questions when Doug and I talked about this is, um, we, I was worried that I would have too much sensitive information on a USB drive. So do you password code it or how do you, like if it falls into the wrong hands, isn't that a concern for you with all of your information on it? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I looked into password, um, to be honest, I looked into password protected USB drives and uh, at the time I probably should spend the money, but you know, I'm not gonna spend the money. Um, so it is what it is. I have, uh, you know, also what 
how much information, obviously, if it falls into the hands of somebody who's going to create my identity or, you know, recreate my identity, you know, I don't know the likelihood of that because that USB drive is in my to-go bag. So that's in my house. So if somebody breaks into my house and they, they're going to take my to-go bag, uh, that other information's in my house elsewhere. So, you know, I'll, I'll call Equifax and deal with it then. Uh, one thing I did do as a backup is um, we sent that USB drive uh, out of town. So that is with uh, a very, very good friend of mine as well, a copy. And that's another thing. If the house burns down and I'm not here, all my stuff is, is dead. And I guess people could use the cloud and whatever. I'm a little, I just haven't done that with the cloud, um, putting that sensitive information on there. Instead, I've left it with a family member that I feel it's secure with. And so worst case scenario, if we lost everything, somebody does have that information. Got it. Okay, good. So can you actually take us through um, for what you have? We actually want to see the items. Yeah. And um, please do tell the story of going to a disaster fair, which my husband went and your wife went. And I was actually jealous because I would have loved it. But I would have been probably the only one in that vehicle with you would enjoy it um uh agreed so you know they had this disaster fair and a guy i work with uh let me know about it and we would you know i'm not again you've it's like it's like smoking food right um i like to smoke food in my smoker but i'm not the guy who's gonna spend 48 hours smoking food so you know like disaster you can run into people that are like yeah i'm building a bunker like i'm not that guy i'm more like I got my bag, I got to cover myself for three days, and then we'll roll out from there. Do you think uh, it's fair to say though that uh, amongst people you know, you are bunker adjacent? Like, bunker <laughs> is not out of the question. <laughs> um, I would say, yeah. I mean, I just got two 55 gallon uh, BPA uh, plastic things for water on the property. So we, we do have that. Um, so sometimes I'm like, Ooh, slippery slope, but, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty good so far. Um, there's some people who are like, I'm going to stay on my ground and protect my home. I, I really, we're going to go safety first. If, if, you know, and I do recommend that to anyone, uh, like you said previously, the firefighters and the police, we don't have any idea what their master plan is and they do have a plan and they're privy to information that we're not. So you really need to, uh, take heed when they say it's time for you to roll, you got to roll. Um, and if, if you're prepared and you have a to-go bag and all this stuff, you're not going to be freaking out. So that's why it's better to be prepared. If you're prepared, then you, you're taken care of and you can help other people, but you can also exit when the time is correct. And when they say go, you need to go. Um, there is just, I just not want enough to echo room. that so strongly that if you spend time arguing with a public um, service person, either a fireman or a firewoman or a police person who is there to tell you to go, it, the longer they have to deal with your arguments for as to why you shouldn't have to leave, that's like one less person they may be able to save. And so many people in our case um, were saved person to person to person to person to person. It was it was a fire, it was fire and a lot of police officers who had to go door to door to actually physically take people out, bring them to safety and go back up to get the next person if they weren't able to be mobile on their own. And while we can respect individual rights, there has to become a point where the safety of the herd, it just has to override everything. And in this case, they tell you to go, you really do just need to go. Yeah. And um, there's a strategy. They have a strategy. They're, they're, they, they, you know, my friend, Sean Norman, he's been doing this since, since we were 14 years old. He started as a, you know, volunteer firefighter at Shell Vista and he's been doing it for a long time. So if I think I'm smarter than my buddy, Sean, and I can just Google it and I'm like, oh, I found out the information on Google. You know, there's a lot of armchair experts out there. I'm, I'm following the lead of the firefighters that have been doing this for a long time. And I really honestly think everybody should. They have, they are thinking we're playing chess maybe two steps ahead. They're playing chess 10 steps ahead. So like heed their advice and pay attention to what the, you know, law enforcement officers have to say. Totally. Okay. Well, let's see what you got. Let's get into my bag. Get into your bag. Um, all right. So um, 
I'm going to, I'm going to move this a little bit just to show okay. you my, can you see my backpacks? I can. So uh, there's my bag and it's just a, a little, you know, it's, it's kind of full, but it's a, it's not that heavy. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a, a bodybuilder by any means. This is Kirsten's bag. What? So uh, we each have a bag to go. Now, initially this bag started as, um, like I said, for an earthquake, if there's an earthquake, you know, um, obviously you, you know, there's, there's all the protocols that you have for an earthquake in your house. If you smell gas, you need to exit the house and a lot of people leave. So a traditional bag is just have your, you know, toothbrush, toothpaste, whatever, something to go. You can go outside and maybe you'll get back in in the next few days. My bag, um, I have added to, again, you don't need to go spend a thousand dollars and like buy everything brand new on, you know, I need to have the Louis Vuitton, uh, you know, bag with all this great stuff in it for me to go to the homeless shelter or go to the shelter, excuse me, um, the emergency shelter. Um, so, um, I've gotten stuff used. I've gotten stuff and a little bit here, an old construction guy told me once, like, I'm like, how'd you get so many tools? He's like, cause you just buy a little tool once a week. And in four years, you have a bunch of tools. You don't go buy four years worth of tools because no one can afford that. And the same with the bag. So slowly add to it as you go along. <clears throat> so in my bag, um, it's really in no particular order. But I have it in, in somewhat of order, but I'm just going to start picking stuff out. Um, so uh, let's see. This is called a Scorpion. And this is a solar powered radio. Um, which oh, is, wait, I have to say at the top of this that in no way does, re, are you personally saying endorsing and nor are we endorsing a particular products. We're endorsing the concept only of being prepared and what products you choose are certainly up to you. Go ahead. Absolutely. Hi, this is Scorpio. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am not a spokesperson for anyone, um, but this is a little wind up. Uh, it's, it's, uh, has a flashlight on it and it's a solar powered radio, which is good and handy for situations where there's no power. Um, old, uh, old medicine things, you know, the, uh, pharmacy things. These are good for just storing stuff. This is my USB drive. So that's in my bag in one of these just so it's protected a little bit but you have these laying around around the house getting rid of it you know use them for storage for certain things i have a bunch of these in the bag as you'll see um put that one away uh backup glasses right so i have a pair kirsten who doesn't see as well as i do she's got a pair and then in her bag there's also backup uh contact lenses uh for um and just a little Again, I got this, uh, it's like a Leatherman, like a, a, you know, poor man's Leatherman or whatever. Uh, I got this at like a, you know, garage sale. It's like, oh, I could use one of those for my bag. So I'm not going and spending $30 on something I may not use. I spent like three bucks on it. I think I talked the guy down for less than that. <clears throat> see. It's like Christmas. I love it. Um, I'm, super, I'm super excited. I may be the only person that Josh, besides whoever watches this, that's very excited about seeing what's in your go bag. <laughs> uh, I think that you probably are the only one that's as excited as I am. Um, so here we have a backup flashlight, a um, couple backup flashlights. So something to remember too, uh, I know I'm not going to use this stuff very often. So I have packed uh, the flashlight but the batteries are separate. You don't want the batteries inside because they could corrode. Um, I also check this bag once every uh, three months. It pops up on my calendar. Just I check my generator, I check my bags. I just kind of go through everything. Sometimes I rotate the batteries. You'll see that I have backup batteries. I rotate those um, on a regular basis. Uh, so, so really, that. you only need to spend about 10 minutes quarterly to make sure that your go bag is how, where it should be. That Exactly. It's a, it, it's a, you're just double checking everything. Um, during and, baseball. Yes. During, during baseball, when uh, the Giants are just blowing out the Dodgers and I'm like, I feel good. I'll double check my bag. 
Uh, this I think I found on sale somewhere and it's just a headlamp. Um, and as you remember, I'm sure, uh, I wish I had a headlamp during the Sonoma, uh, those Sonoma fires. It is, was so smoky and, uh, you know, it was dark most of the day. Um, and obviously I'm watering down a roof for, for four days and taking care of stuff. So the headset really would have been handy. I was happy that we had lighting period and a flashlight, but in retrospect, I saw a headlamp on sale and I, I grabbed it. Um, so, and if you're also, if you're, you know, if you don't have a car and you have to walk out of a situation or, you know, the freeways are packed and, you know, you got to exit with your backpack, this is a good option to have. And just so everybody knows, it's not in our, with the kinds of fires that we have now, it's not necessarily an unusual situation where you'd find yourself with just your bag and possibly not your car. Because if you would have to know how, you know, in California, we now have a law that you have to have battery backup on your, for every new garage door, um, mechanism that's installed, but a lot of people still don't have that. And so you may not have your car. So you do need to think in terms of if it's really, if I just grab my go bag and say, I don't even have a vehicle and I have to run for my life, which did happen, does happen, unfortunately, really terrible stories. Having that headlamp is, is going to make a big difference for you. Absolutely. And just to be clear, in our car too, both of our cars, we have a little mini to go bag. So, and I got these ones. These are free. Back to the disaster fair. <laughs> uh, they always just handing out a lot of free stuff. So we did two mini bags because, you know, if I'm in a meeting in Santa Monica or in a meeting in Marina del Rey and something goes down, uh, my bag's here at home. Uh, so I have a mini version, change of clothes, water, power bars, um, you know, hopefully you won't go break into our cars. If you do, you'll get $100 cash each. Uh, but um, yeah, small bills, 100 bucks. You may need that $100 for gas. Uh, ATMs could be out. Uh, gas stations may only take cash. Uh, you never know. It's always good to have a little backup in the car. It and we've actually... Use that. I can for other support things. you in that too. That it's not that if it was that um, when there's no power, then the ATMs cannot work, and that means that people also cannot use your card in order to you know accept payment. So it it may sound um, a little Armageddonish, but I want people to understand that you really just need enough money to get through about three days. You will be able to usually get to an ATM but it has to be in a place that actually has power. And a lot of these places simultaneously with, with this giant fire disaster, of course, the infrastructure often burns too, or they've turned the grid off to prevent future um, or other fires. Exactly. And that's again, uh, why you have a full tank instead of a half tank. Um, and it, you know, it's just, it's easier just to fill that up. Always have a full tank. Do you want to wait in line? You know, I, I don't own a gas station, but I'm sure when the power's out, the gas pumps can't work. And you, you just have a lot of stuff to deal with in that situation. So you're kind of better off, you know, on your way home from work and you see, you know, top, top your gas tank off. You're going to spend the money and put it in the gap in the tank eventually anyway. So just take that little extra second and you'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> on that note as well, that gas in that car is also a backup for our generator. So, each gallon of gas in my car is eight hours of time for my generator at home. So uh, if I have to siphon that gas and I have a siphon thing, um, doesn't everyone? Um, <laughs> no, it's just like not, a little ho -ho I think that was, that's very 80s of you, it is. but it's, it's really smart, but it's very- I used 80s. to have to siphon gas out of the, our old beater car and put it in the carburetor to start it. So, but um, that is extra gas for the generator. So win-win. Really, just take care of it. Um, next up, backup um, cords. Uh, I have a backup charger. Again, you can find this stuff at, I got, my wife and I like thrifting and all that stuff. So this is just a little old Apple USB thing and uh, a phone charger and this small little baby charger, uh, which can be used for many different things. Um, so I always have a backup. We still have our ones around the house and hopefully we'd be have time to grab them but in the event that we can't it's in the bag and it's ready to go another thing that i did put in our go bag this time was a power strip 
because uh, you don't know where you're going to actually end up if you, you know, right now we're in the age of COVID and a pandemic. Um, so the other thing that we have is, oh, I have to get the name of it, um, but it's a thing you can plug into your, your cigarette lighter in your car if you still have, you know, whatever they're called, 12 volts, and it turns it into a regular cord, a regular three-pronged plug. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yeah, I have in here, you know, we all have these old, again, it's just a car, a car one in the backup as well. But it might be my car, it might be somebody else's car. I don't know what the, where the situation is going to take me, but I do know that that is a source of power that is readily available um, because there's car batteries everywhere. Uh, I'm going to look into that one because that sounds actually pretty cool. Well, you might just get it for Christmas. Ooh. Because that, I, got, I got one for my in-laws and for oh, um, nice. aunt and uncle-in-law and parents too, and I got them ones that are full power strips that they could just hook up to their cars. Oh, love it. Um, I might steal that from you and give, give them one. I won't give you one because you already have them, but yeah. I'll give them to family members. I hope you've enjoyed this time listening to uh, Josh and I talk about what happened here in Sonoma County in 2017 and how he sort of shifted his thinking and really made things different for uh, himself and his wife, Kirsten. We're now going to go into part two, which is the next uh, podcast episode. And again, you know, we chose to do this because the conversation went on for a long, for kind of a long time, because there's a lot to cover if you want to be uh, prepared and resilient inside of your own home. Remember, the government will do a lot for you, but they are never going to do everything. And so much of how a community uh, responds to and recovers from a disaster is really dependent upon how the citizens are prepared and able to even step up. So I hope you'll join us for part two, but thank you so much for spending this time with us in part one. Thank you for joining us on How to Disaster, a playbook to recover, rebuild, and reimagine. I wanna leave you with this one thought. Thank you for spending your time with us. And we want you to know that you can get through this. You can recover, rebuild, and reimagine. But there's only one way you're going to do it, and that's together. <laughs>